Okay, let's continue with part three of uh, week two material on Java and threading. This, this uh, section talks about thread coordination and thread states. And we're going to illustrate the problems that we get with thread coordination using the dining philosophers problem. This was originally introduced by Dijkstra to illustrate the problems that occur when different threads need to access the same resource. The general problem is known as resource contention. So what we have here is five philosophers all sat around a table and philosophers, unfortunately, are all male in all the examples I can find. So I apologize. And at some stage, we'll, we'll fix this problem with an all female philosophers problem or an all gender neutral philosophers problem. Um, but basically, all our philosophers either eat or think. And there's just this shared fork or chopstick. So to be able to eat, the philosopher needs to acquire both forks or both chopsticks, as you'll see in the other example, before they can eat. So the, the state machine for a philosopher is that they think for a while. Once they finish thinking and they're hungry, they change to a hungry state and they try to pick up the chopsticks or the forks to eat. Once they've acquired both the forks they need, they can only eat with both. Try eating with one chopstick, it's not easy. Um, then they eat for a while, and then when they're satiated and not hungry anymore, they put down the chopsticks and start thinking again. And they just go around in a loop doing this forever, because that's what philosophers do. So the pseudocode for a philosopher, forever, they're initially thinking, then they want to eat, so they pick up the left fork, pick up the right fork, they start eating, and then they put down the right fork, and they put down the left fork. They're not hungry anymore, so they go back to thinking. That's all philosophers do, very simple state machines. Here's a, an example of implementing this in Java as a thread. So here you can see we have a philosopher which implements runnable. It has two chopsticks which are passed to it in its constructor and it assigns them to, to local members. And then, so basically, it, the different chopsticks are passed to different philosophers, but each of these will be shared by at least one other philosopher, if you think about the, the topology of the table. So then, in the run method, forever, they log an event saying they're thinking. Then here we have a synchronized block whereby they um, synchronize on the left chopstick. So they acquire their left chopstick, which means they picked it up. And then they have a synchronized block on the right chopstick. So if they have, get exclusive access to that chopstick. So if they get to here, the philosopher has picked up both chopsticks and they can eat away and then eventually they finish eating and they release the synchronized blocks. They put down the left chopstick and the right chopstick because the synchronized blocks exit. And then they go back to thinking. So that's all philosophers do. Acquire the left chopstick, the right chopstick, and then eat and put them down. Before we look at what happens, have a watch of this video on YouTube. Um, it's quite short and illustrates the sorts of problems that you get with this scenario. So I'll pause this video and flip to YouTube for a minute or two. When I run the code, this is um, not the first time, not the output I get the first time, but it's the output I get about the third time, is that each of the philosophers starts thinking. That's their initial state. The way the they are scheduled, they start thinking, and then suddenly they all pick up their left chopstick in sort of random order, different order so they started thinking, but they all pick up their left chopstick. And as you saw in the previous video, if they all have their left chopstick, then none of them can eat because we have a deadlock. So feel free to run the code, it's available in the examples, but you'll, I suspect, see very, very similar. So this is a general problem known as deadlock. When 
two or more threads are sharing access to shared variables uh, via locks. Thread one takes lock A, thread two takes lock B, and then thread one wants to get um, object B, so it tries to get the lock, but it's blocked because thread one has acquired the lock. And then thread two says, okay, I want to get object A, so I'll go to try acquire the lock on A, but it's blocked because thread one has acquired this lock. So it's called a deadly embrace or a deadlock. Neither thread can continue. And the system basically stalls. Neither thread can proceed. And it violates what's known as the liveness property of a system. And systems, liveness properties, liveness is a very good property of a system because it means eventually something is good is going to happen. We're going to make progress. And when a system is deadlocked, it's not live. In the dining philosopher's problem and in many common resource contention problems, the cause of this is what's known as a circular weight. If you think about it, when the philosophers pick up their forks, the table is actually illustrative of the shape of the circle. So they all basically have picked up the resources, but they, they, there's dependence on the, the, their neighbour putting a resource down, but they, they can't because they all have acquired the resources and they're deadlocked. The general solution to this is to make sure that you impose a total ordering on the acquisition of the resources. So in the dining philosopher's problem, this is done quite simply. We say that any philosopher must acquire chopstick zero before they acquire chopstick one, before they acquire chopstick two, etc. This is pertinent because if you think about philosopher four, this means that normally in the code the example we had so far, they would have picked up chopstick four and then chopstick zero. But with this ordering constraints imposed, they can't do that anymore. This means philosopher four will must acquire chopstick zero before chopstick four. This breaks the circular weight deadlock. And it's very easy to implement in the code. So here we've just made a slight modification to um, invoking the philosopher threads. So we just say within our loop, if we have the last philosopher, so this is philosopher four, we give them the right fork and then the left fork. Whereas all the other philosophers, we give the left fork and the right fork. So this means that the philosopher um, number four will always pick up their right fork before their left fork. Whereas all the other philosophers will pick up their left fork before their right fork. And so it's breaking this circular weights condition and hence it breaks the deadlock. And again, if you run the code, you'll find that the system does not deadlock anymore. So this is a really good illustration of why concurrency is tricky. If you don't have enough ordering constraints on your access to shared resources, you get race conditions. But sometimes if you have too many constraints on the access to shared resources such that you can get circular weights, then you get deadlocks. And it's just very hard to design these systems. Um, it also makes testing extremely difficult because non-determinism leads to essentially an infinite number of possible interleavings, an infinite number of possible results, because you're not controlling the complete execution of the code. So you really have to think very carefully about your access to shared resources and avoid deadlocks on resource contention. Let's just quickly look at thread states, which are uh, important to understand because these help you, you um, comprehend how the system is actually managing states underneath. So basically, states are managed by the JVM and by an operating system using a state machine. When we create a thread, um, we basically put it into the runnable state. So this means that it's basically had its, its uh, dot .start method called. It's ready to run. When a thread is then running, 
it's in the runnable state. And this means it's either running or it's able to run. It wants to run. It just um, hasn't got access to the CPU yet. So you can imagine that the scheduler is handling a queue of threads that want to run. And when run, one runs, it runs for a particular time period until it blocks. And then the next thread in the queue is, is able to run. You say threads in the runnable state can either block, so they might try to acquire a lock on a synchronized method and be blocked, or they might terminate. That's the end of their life and they move into this dead state. Blocked threads can be woken up. So when a lock is released uh, by a synchronized method that a thread is waiting for, then that thread will be woken up and put back into the runnable state. And then it's able to access the lock as long as it's the next one to acquire it. So this basically is the life cycle of threads. They get created, they're ready to run, they're runnable, they can get blocked by various events, and uh, like file IOs will cause a thread to block, etc., or a network IO, and eventually they terminate. So a thread is not runnable if one of the following occurs. We saw earlier sleep. So if we invoke sleep, basically we put the thread into the blocked state until the sleep timer expires, until at least the time that is specified. The thread suspends itself, it calls a method called wait, and we'll see what wait a little bit later in the next module. Um, and waits can be woken up by notifications, and so these are a, a pair of operations that, that cause a block and, and a, a, a thread to be released from that block when it's notified to wake up. Uh, and, yet, and a thread will also be not runnable if it does a blocking I.O. So a file I.O. or a network I.O. typically um, will cause a thread to wait until the I.O. completes. If the thread is asleep, then the timer expires for at least the time specified. The thread is suspended. It must be resumed by somebody. Uh, so someone calls resume on the thread that's suspended. If it's waiting on a condition variable, this is the wait operation, then it has to be woken up by a notify or a notify all condition. And if the thread is waiting on IO, then the IO has to complete so that it can um, work with the results of the IO. Java scheduler also is a priority scheduler. By default, all threads are created with priority five and handled exactly the same with equal priority. Um, but you can create threads with anything from zero priority to 10 priority. And if a thread with a higher priority is available, so say there's a thread with a priority of 10 available to run, it will preempt a thread with a normal priority or a lower priority, in fact. And a minimum priority thread will only run when no one else wants to run. So this is kind of a background thread, which are occasionally useful things. But typically, um, you you'll f won't find in most of your Java systems that you write, unless you're interacting with probably real hardware, that you ever need to worry about thread priority. Just use the defaults. Um, the, the scheduler then just chooses the thread that's available to run with the highest priority for execution. And if there's multiple threads available with the same priority, it just chooses one in a round robin fashion. And so a higher priority becomes runnable until a thread yields. So there's a dot yield method, which an executing thread can um, execute to, to say, I've finished for a while. I don't want to execute anymore. Give the CPU to somebody else uh, or its run method exits. Uh, or the scheduler will implement some sort of time slice. So let's just assume it's a millisecond. A scheduler will execute a thread for a millisecond. And if it's still continuing to execute at some computation, which takes longer than a millisecond, it will be preempted by the scheduler and say, go back into the runnable queue and you'll get another chance soon. I want to give somebody else a chance to execute so we don't starve other threads of execution time. One more concept that you should know about is re-entrancy. So we talked earlier about how every Java object has a monitor lock associated with it. And when a method is called on an object which is synchronized or it executes a synchronized block, then that monitor lock is acquired. And no one else can execute a synchronized method on that, that 
objects until the thread which has acquired the lock releases it. Okay, so let's look at an example. Here we have a object called capital L bar, which extends this base class. The base class has a synchronized method called do hits to stuff. And the class capital L bar, which inherits from this, also has a synchronized method called order drinks. And order drinks calls its superclasses do hipster stuff method, which is also synchronized. So when a call comes in to order a drink, only one drink can be ordered at a time because the method is synchronized. This means the thread that's calling order drinks acquires the monitor log. This method then calls another synchronized method, but it's the same class. It's the super class, but it's basically the same object. So what happens? We're calling two synchronized methods on the same objects. That's not allowed. The rules that we talked about earlier. Well, actually, this, this will actually work because intrinsic locks, the monitor locks, are re-entrants. That means if a thread tries to acquire a lock that it already holds, it will succeed. And if you think about it on the previous thread, the example, the thread when it orders a drink acquires the lock. It then calls another synchronized method on the same object, but it already holds the lock for that particular object. So the same thread holds the lock. So this means it just can increment a lock acquisition count. So it's now saying I've got this lock twice. When the first synchronized method ends, the lock acquisition count is decremented. And when it exits the second um, synchronized method, then the, the lock count becomes zero and the method, the, the object is now available for access by another object, another thread. Sorry. So re-entrancy is an important thing because it stops so random deadlocks occurring. Um, and you'll find that nearly all runtime systems, the languages implement re-entrancy. Um, so this, the same thread can acquire the same locks, multiple locks on the same object, as long as it's the only one which has the locks. OK, that's the end of the discussion on deadlock. What we'll do next is talk about a problem called the producer-consumer problem, which is a really common pattern of a solution within multi-threaded systems.